Welcome everybody. You're very welcome here to our home, to Bliss Escop and to the chapel, where together we are going to share in a service of readings and reflections and prayers on Good Friday. It's always important, of course, that we reflect upon and contemplate the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, but perhaps never more so than at this present uh, very troubled time. The passion shows us that Jesus understands and cares for us in all of our pains because he has shared those pains with us. But of course the cross gives us great hope uh, beyond the pain. Ruth's going to explain to us now the format that this uh, service of meditation will take. So we're going to be looking at the passion of Jesus Christ from the readings in Mark's Gospel in a series of episodes and each episode will contain the reading, a meditation on the body of Jesus Christ, a body that suffered and died for us and yet which was the body of the Word made flesh as the incarnate Son of God. We'll read a hymn as a poem uh, which might strike you afresh with some of the words. You will hear a section from Handel's Messiah and at the same time see a relevant image of the Passion for you to reflect, contemplate and meditate. There'll be a pause for silence between each of these elements and then a last shorter section um, with a different passage of scripture with prayers interspersed within it. So let us walk in heart and mind with Jesus from Gethsemane to Golgotha and reflect on all that that means for us today. Let us pray. Almighty Father, look with mercy on this, your family, gathered here today, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was content to be betrayed, given up into the hands of sinners, and to suffer death upon the cross for our sins. In this cross we see the cost of our transgressions, and the depth of your love. In humble hope and fear, may we place at his feet this day all that we have and all that we are, that the blessings of his cross may be ours, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And now we begin with our first reading. Jesus is in the garden. And I'm reading from Mark 14, from verse 32. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John, and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. 
Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. A short period of silence. Lord Jesus, we see you there in the garden on your knees. We see you there on knees that have knelt so often to pray. In times apart, before the break of day, when you had sought times of intimacy with your Father. Lord, we know that to you, prayer came so easily. No halting words, but the simple, easy intimacy of love. And here too, Lord, we see you on your knees again in prayer. But such a prayer. No easy intimacy of love, but hard and bitter agony. No simple acceptance of your Father's will, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. No simple acceptance of your Father's will, and yet acceptance nonetheless. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Thank you, Lord, that you conformed your will to your Father's will, for our sake. And Lord, as we see you on your knees here in the garden, we know that it was not prayer alone that brought you to your knees, but loneliness, distress and fear. And so we pray for all those who feel themselves today in this troubled period to be alone and isolated, who know distress and who live in fear. We bring such people, Lord, we bring ourselves to you. And so we see, Lord, that it was not the disciples alone whose spirits were willing, but whose flesh was weak. And yet that weakness did not stop you. It did not stop you from rising from your knees when the hour had come to meet your betrayer.
And now from Mark 14, beginning to read at verse 43, we read the story of Jesus' arrest. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs, from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs? to arrest me as though I were a bandit. Day after day, I was with you in the, te in the temple teaching and you didn't arrest me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. Lord Jesus, when they came to arrest you, their hands held so many things, swords and clubs, sticks and lanterns. Maybe Judas held in his hand one of the silver coins as he rushed forwards to betray you. They came armed, you met them unarmed and defenceless with empty hands. You met force with no resistance. And so we pray for all those who in this still troubled world work for peace, putting aside swords and clubs, following you with empty hands. And today we pray especially for peace in this same city, in Jerusalem, whose streets have been so often stained with blood. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem and for all the lands that surround her. We pray too today for those whose hands do not hold weapons of war, but instead who hold instruments of healing. And we pray for all of those especially who work for us in our National Health Service. And Lord, we thank you that you met violence with peace and indeed with healing, with empty hands, not only to lead us, uh, leave us an example, but that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Thank you, Lord, that fulfilling your Father's will meant so much more to you than defending your own self-interest. And Lord, we recognise that to meet violence with peace was always your way and is simply the way of the cross. May it be our way too. We recognise too that it took such courage to stand there empty-handed, not to run away and flee as you surely could have done, but to meet the crowd holding nothing, with no defence, with empty hands. My song is love unknown. 
my Saviour's love to me. Love to the loveless shown, that they might lovely be. Oh, who am I, that for my sake my Lord should take frail flesh and die? He came from his blessed throne, salvation to bestow. But men made strange, and none the longed for Christ would know. But, O oh, my friend, my friend indeed, who at my need his life did spend. Sometimes they strew his way, and his sweet praises sing, resounding all the day, hosannas to their king. Then crucify is all their breath, and for his death they thirst and cry. They rise and needs will have my dear Lord made away. A murderer they save, a prince of life they slay. Yet cheerful he to suffering goes, that, the, that he his foes from thence might free. In life no house, no home my Lord on earth might have. In death no friendly tomb, but what a stranger came. What may I say? Heaven was his home, and mine the tomb wherein he lay. Here might I stay and sing no story so divine. Never was love, dear king, never was grief like thine. This is my friend, in whose sweet praise I all my days could gladly spend.
Jesus before the Sanhedrin. Reading from verse 53 of Mark chapter 14. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony didn't agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I'll destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. The guards also took him over and beat him. Lord Jesus, the stories we hear about you are full of your wonderful words. You opened your mouth to speak in parables, words that paint pictures for us, leading us gently into truth and love. Words of rebuke and challenge, calling for radical change. Words of command bringing wholeness and fullness and life. Words of truth, opening our minds to the wide horizons of your Father's kingdom. And yet here before the Sanhedrin, your mouth is strangely silent. We hear plenty of voices. The voice of Peter has already denied you at the fireside. And now we hear the harsh voices of those bringing false and conflicting testimony against you. And yet perhaps your silence is not so strange. You who spoke only truth, how could you respond to such lies? How could you give them a dignity they did not deserve? by answering and defending yourself. Even when they strike you and call on you to prophesy, you keep your counsel. As a sheep before her shearers is silent, so you did not open your mouth. Lord, help us, we pray, to be simple of speech, speaking simple truth with abundant love, especially to those who in this troubled time need to hear your words of truth and peace and love. And yet finally you did open your mouth to speak. In the face of lies you remain silent, but faced with the truth, how can you not confess who you are? 
in this perverse course lies are truth and truth is blasphemy but the truth must and will be told thank you lord that your mouth speaks no lie and only the truth and only love are good enough for you He stood before the court, on trial, instead of us. He met its power to hurt, condemned to face the cross. Our king, accused of treachery. Our God, abused for blasphemy. These are the crimes that tell the tale of human guilt. Our sins, our death, our hell. On these the case is built. To this world's powers, the Lord stays dumb. The guilt is ours, no answers come. The sentence must be passed, the unknown prisoner killed. The price is paid at last, the law of God fulfilled. He takes the blame, and from that day, the accuser's claim is wiped away. Shall we be judged and tried? In Christ, our trial is done. We live, for he has died our condemnation gone. In Christ are we both dead and raised, alive and free. His name be praised.
And now from Mark chapter 15, Jesus is taken before Pilate. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man named Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realised it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again, Then what do you wish me to do with the man that you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Lord Jesus, as we see this story advance, so we see your body more and more abused. Hands that were stretched out in blessing are now bound. When you had chosen to walk your own way, now you are led wherever they will. And finally, to satisfy a fickle crowd, Barabbas is released. They pull the robe from your black back and they flog you. Where argument and truth and justice will not do, violence becomes a gross substitute. Lord Jesus, stay the hand we pray of those who all too easily strike the poor and defenceless. Bring your justice to bear in an often bitter and violent world. Protect those who in this time of isolation find themselves stranded in frightening situations. But Lord, you offered your back to those who beat you. You did not hide your face from mocking and spitting. Because, Lord, your back was broad, broad enough not only to bear this beating, but to carry the sins of the whole world. And, Lord, we acknowledge with pain, but with thanks, that the back that carried the cares and sins of this world was first of all flogged and you suffered all that for us.
Ah, holy Jesus, how hast thou offended that man to judge thee hath in hate pretended? Thy foes derided, by thine own rejected, O oh, most afflicted. Who was the guilty? Who brought this upon thee? Alas, my chief treason, Jesus, hath undone thee. T'was I, Lord Jesus, I it was denied thee. I crucified thee. Lo, the good shepherd for the sheep is offered. The slave hath sinned, and the son hath suffered. For man's atonement, while we nothing heeded, God interceded. For me, kind Jesus, was thine incarnation, thy mortal sorrow, and thy life's oblation. Thy death of anguish and thy bitter passion for my salvation. Therefore, kind Jesus, since I cannot pay thee, I do adore thee and will ever pray thee. Think on thy pity and thy love unswerving not my deserving. Jesus is mocked. Mark chapter 15, starting at verse 16. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, 
and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews. They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. Lord, your head that once was crowned with glory is crowned now with thorns. A painful crown, a mocking crown, mocking your royalty and your dignity. You who are the head of all things, holding the scepter of your authority in your right hand are struck on the head with a star. And yet, Lord, this is your royalty. This is your true dignity to be in this place, not to stand upon your rights, but rather to rule in humility, to rule in suffering, to rule in service. This is the true royal way the way of him who is head over all things the way of whom of him whom before whom every human power will one day have to bow teach us lord where true power really lies and teach us not to abuse it teach us where true dignity lies and to seek it in humility. Teach us in this time to love you and serve you in those who are weak and fearful and powerless and suffering. And Lord, we acknowledge that this mocking shadow of the truth, the purple robe and the crown of thorns, does nonetheless lead us to the truth. The truth that royal dignity and power are yours, that the crown and the robe are truly yours, and we are glad to live under your sad, suffering, yet royal gaze. Come and see. Come and see the King of Love. See the purple robe and crown of thorns he wears. Soldiers mock, rulers sneer as he lifts the cruel cross. Low and friendless now, he climbs towards the hill. Come and weep, come and mourn for your sin that pierced him there, so much deeper than the wounds of thorn and nail. All our pride, all our greed, all our fallenness and shame. And the Lord has laid the punishment on him. 
man of heaven, born to earth, to restore us to your heaven. Here, we bow in awe before your searching eyes. From your tears comes our joy. From your death, our life shall spring. By your resurrection power, we shall rise. We worship at your feet, where wrath and mercy meet. And a guilty world is washed by love's pure stream. For us, he was made sin. Oh, help me take it in. Deep wounds of love cry out, Father, forgive. I worship. I worship the Lamb who was slain.
Jesus is crucified. Reading from Mark 15, from verse 21. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he didn't take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, uh -huh, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He can't save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. Lord, we look at your feet as you hang there upon the cross. Feet that are rough with wear. Feet that are dusty from walking the roads of Galilee and then down to Jerusalem. Toughened by the streets. Your feet too that have been softened by anointing, as Mary anointed you in love. These are feet that have carried you to teach, to heal, to eat, to live, to love. And Lord, we pray that our feet will carry us to do the same in your name as your body. And in this time particularly, may our feet be ready to move according to your purposes, to bring love and compassion to those in need. And yet now your feet that uh, have done so much good have carried you to die. And we see them shattered by the nails. Nails that pin you to the cross, powerless now to move. Feet that in their pain take the weight of your body as you fight for each and every breath. And Lord, we worship at your feet. We worship at the foot of the cross. We fall at your feet not only because you are Lord of all, but because your body was broken for us. We fall at your feet because you love us. We fall at your feet on the cross because there is no other place where we find such love. And there is no other place that we would rather be. O sacred head, sore wounded, defiled, and put to scorn. O kingly head, surrounded with mocking crown of thorn. What sorrow mars thy grandeur? 
can death thy bloom deflower? O oh, countenance whose splendour the hosts of heaven adore. Thy beauty, long desired, hath vanished from our sight. Thy power is all expired and quenched the light of light. Ah, me, for whom thou diest, hide not so far thy grace. Show me, O oh love most highest, the brightness of thy face. In thy most bitter passion, my heart to share doth cry with thee for my salvation upon the cross to die. Ah, oh, keep my heart thus moved to stand thy cross beneath, to mourn thee, well beloved, yet thank thee for thy death. What language shall I borrow to thank thee, dearest friend, for this thy dying sorrow, thy pity without end. Oh, make me thine for ever. And should I fainting be, Lord, let me never, never outlive my love for thee. My days are few. Oh, fail not with thine immortal power to hold me, that I quail not in death's most fearful hour that I may fight befriended and see in my last strife to me thine arms extended upon the cross of life.
crucifixion, reading from Mark 15, from verse 33. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three o'clock in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son. Lord, we know that every breath you took on the cross was hard and bitter agony for you. Your chest stretched to suffocation. Each gasp only achieved by pushing with your failing strength against your nail-pierced feet. And so, particularly at this time, we pray for all those who at the moment are struggling for breath, for those in hospital, for those on ventilators, for those struggling still at home, for those fearful of the pain of breathing. Lord Jesus, in the loneliness of your agony and with what little breath you have, you call to your Father, who seems to have forsaken you. And then with one last cry, you breathe no more. The last breath exits your lungs, not to be replaced by another. We think of Adam, breathed into life by your Father's breath, the breath and wind of the Spirit a spirit and a breath that has deserted you now in death. And yet we know here today in the light of your cross that your lungs were emptied of breath and your body of life, that your life-giving spirit might be breathed once again into us, that where you hung and died and fought for every breath, we might stand and breathe and live. But Lord, what hard and bitter price you paid for that. To die for us. To have the Father whom you had loved and been loved by from all eternity turn his face away from you. Lord, may we live all our lives and breathe our every breath in the light of the debt you paid and of the debt that you died. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away 
as wounds which mar the chosen one, bring many sons to glory. Behold, the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Jesus' body is removed from the cross. Mark 15 from verse 42. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid. And so, Lord, your body was taken down from the cruel cross 
by Joseph of Arimathea, who legend says came to these far distant Cornish shores. Your body was taken down from that cross where it had hung, lifeless now, your last breath gone. We feel the dead weight of your corpse as they struggle to detach it, to hold it, to lower it, and finally to bury it. And we think again that you became one of us in every way, even unto death. You wholly inhabited our humanity. Your body was weighty and real, no less physical than ours. And we thank you therefore that you sympathise with every human weakness and frailty, every illness and sickness that we may suffer. And we pray especially now for all those who are sick, for all those, yes, who are sick in body, from the coronavirus and in any other way. But for those two who are sick in mind and whose sickness has been exacerbated by this current crisis, we entrust them all, Lord, to your care, to your comfort, and to your loving arms. And as we think of the weight of your body, we think of the immense value you place on us. This weight was the price you paid for us, outweighing all our offences and all our sins. This weight, the weight of your very body, your whole self, is nothing less than the value you place on us. You value us so much more highly than you valued your own self, your own body. And today we dare to call ourselves your body, made your living body by your death for us. May we be a body that only knows our word in the light of the weight of the cross in the light of the weight of your body, in the light of the value you give us, in the light of the price you pay for us. No weight of gold or silver can measure human worth. No soul secures its ransom with all the wealth of earth. No sinners find their freedom, but by the gift unpriced, the Lamb of God, unblemished, the precious blood of Christ. Our sins, our griefs and troubles, he bore and made his own. We hid our faces from him, rejected and alone. His wounds are for our healing. Our peace is by his pain. Behold, the man of sorrows, the lamb for sinners slain. In Christ, the past is over. A new world now begins. With him, we rise to freedom who saves us from our sins. We live by faith in Jesus to make his glory known. Behold, the man of sorrows, the lamb upon his throne.
So in this last section of our time together, we're going to be reflecting on some other words of scripture, words from Isaiah 53 that Christians have always taken as pointing forward to the passion of Jesus Christ. And we're going to bring our intercessions to the Lord uh, in the light of what we read uh, from Isaiah. We will follow that with the words of the last hymn that Ruth will read for us before I close our time together with a blessing. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Lord, we acknowledge that had we been there, we too would have joined the shouting mob, joining in their despising and rejection of you, joined in their failure to esteem you, to understand you, to value you. But today, Lord, we thank you that for all that, and despite all we are, you do not despise us. You do not reject us, and you esteem us far beyond our worth. Indeed, today we thank you that you allowed yourself to be rejected, that we might be accepted, to suffer, that we might be healed, to be despised, that we might be prized, treasured and valued. So from the depths of our sin and for the depths of your love, we thank you, Lord. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Lord, in a corrupt world, gone astray and turned to its own way, where power is valued above weakness, wealth above poverty, and violence and force above love, we thank you that you walked a different road and demonstrated where true power, true wealth and true love are to be found, as in your suffering you took the iniquity of this world upon yourself. Thank you that that path which we thought led nowhere leads instead to all that is true, to all that is good, to all that is lovely. We thank you that it leads us home to the Father. Help us, Lord Jesus, to walk with you down that road alone. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, 
and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Thank you, Lord, that the punishment you bore was our punishment. The death you died was our death. The tomb in which you were laid was our tomb. For you had done no violence, and there was no deceit in your mouth. Thank you that you who had done no evil were assigned a grave with the wicked for our sake. Thank you that the Lord's will has indeed prospered in your nail-pierced hands. Amen. Glory be to Jesus, who in bitter pains poured for me the lifeblood from his sacred veins. Grace and life eternal in that blood I find. Blessed be his compassion, infinitely kind. Abel's blood for vengeance pleaded to the skies. But the blood of Jesus for our pardon cries. Oft, as it is sprinkled on our guilty hearts, Satan, in confusion, terror-struck, departs. Oft, as earth exulting wafts its praise on high, angel hosts rejoicing make their glad reply. Lift ye then your voices, swell the mighty flood, louder still and louder. Praise the Lamb of God. Before I pronounce this final blessing, I invite you to look around you, as it were, in your mind's eye. Look around the home that you may be in by yourself or that you might share with others. Look around your, your local community. Look around in your mind's eye this wonderful land of Cornwall. And let your mind's eye too range across the whole earth. It is these places, our homes, our hearts and beyond, that need at this time, above all, the blessing of our God. The blessing that he has made real for us in the cross of Christ. Christ crucified draw you to himself to find in him a sure ground for faith, a firm support for hope and the assurance of sins forgiven. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and all those whom you love this Good Friday this Easter tide and forevermore.